really an honor and I'm very excited to be with you all for the first Arctic Institute conference. I'm so deeply inspired by your work, um, the work of the Arctic Institute. You all bring me great hope for the future, enormous hope. So it's really, I'm really, really excited to be here. So just to start, with, with the melting ice due to climate change, increased strategic rivalry, competition for resources and militarization of the Arctic, and the heightened tensions in US-Russia relations since the devastating Russian invasion and war in Ukraine, now at their worst ever since the Cold War, the fate and future of the Arctic is inextricably linked to the fate and future of humanity. Likewise, the existential threats of nuclear war and climate change are inextricably linked. There are so many intersectionalities here. To name just one, the trillions spent on nuclear weapons and militarism are desperately needed to address climate change. UN Secretary General Guterres has said we are at a code red moment for humanity due to climate change. And with the increased risk of escalation to a nuclear exchange over the war in Ukraine, we are now in a code red for humanity arising from the nuclear threat. So we're actually now in an unprecedented double code red moment for humanity. At times like this, one person can make a difference and many people acting together can change history. Powerful demonstrations of our ability to cooperate for the benefit of humanity can be game changing, which is why the international cooperation demonstrated by you all of the Arctic Institute is so inspiring. Ambassador Elaine White Gomez of Costa Rica who presided over the negotiations at the United Nations for the landmark treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons in 2017 says, history is made by every single step we take every day. No act is insignificant. Each and every one of us can make a difference. And we all have a role to play in changing our human story in ensuring a sustainable future for our children and generations to come. At times of grave danger and heightened tensions like this, track to people to people citizen diplomacy scientific and environmental cooperation, cooperation on nuclear risk reduction are more important than ever. Climate change and nuclear risk do not take a time out during war. In fact, the need now for such cooperation is even more urgent, which is why the suspension of cooperation in these and other areas at this time is so deeply alarming. Today, we're going to look at some examples of how citizen diplomacy opened hearts changed minds and transformed re relations between the United States and Soviet Union and helped bring about an end to the Cold War. And as we go through these examples, I really would like all of you to think about what might be the analogs today, 40 years later. Then we're going to fast forward to today and look at some of examples of how citizen diplomacy and indig indigenous wisdom have positively impacted US-Russia relations in recent years and it's some efforts that could be game changing and imagine together what the analogs from the 1980s might be today that could touch hearts, open minds and contribute to better relations between the US and Russia among all countries in the Arctic and around the world. So I'm gonna share my screen now and start the presentation. So we're going to begin by traveling, sorry about that, traveling back in time to the world that I grew up in, which was the world of the Cold War. And from the time I can remember at my earliest age, um, I was told both at school and my church and on reinforced every night on the evening news that the Soviet Union was the enemy, the Berlin Wall was never going to come down in my lifetime, and that we were almost likely going to die in a nuclear war. The fear of nuclear war was omnipresent and palpable. So we're going to focus today on the 1980s um, because that's the time when the citizen diplomacy movement really was born. And I want to just set the conditions of what was going on at that time. And this is a very different time today, but there are parallels that I think you'll all recognize in terms of um, what was going on in, ten, in terms of tensions and um, in, in nuclear risk in a different way, but it was it was there. So um, we had Ronald the election of President Ronald Reagan in the United States in 1980, who campaigned on a platform of peace through strength. And once he was elected, he was committed 
to uh, a nuclear arms buildup that was the largest in history um, to date at that point. In 1983, um, things got worse in relations. He gave a speech where he called the Soviet Union the evil empire and said that they are the focus of evil in the modern world. Then in September 1983, September 1st, KAL flight 007 um, strayed into Soviet airspace and was shot down by a Soviet military pilot. There were 269 people on board, including 61 Americans, an American congressman, and there happened to be a friend of mine from college on the plane as well. It was a devastating uh, moment. Um, it plummeted relations still further. Um, and just a few weeks later, uh, at this moment of high tensions, there was a nuclear false alarm that in some, some people think might have been one of the worst of all time, when there was a malfunction of the Soviet satellite early warning system. And um, Stanislav Petrov, who had replaced someone who was supposed to be on call that night, and he was a civilian, not a military person, made the judgment when the a uh, warning came in that a missile was coming from the United States that he thought it was a false alarm. He restarted the system up to five times and he still kept getting the same message and he did not report it. And he um, you know, broke with sort of the rules completely at that time, but he is called the man who saved the world. A few months later in November, we, there, there was um, a NATO military exercise known as Able Archer, where um, it was, it was conceived by the, the Russians as perhaps a, um, a ruse to actually launch a first strike against the Soviet Union. So um, they began to make uh, concrete proper preparations um, for nuclear war. And these were monitored and seen by the West and they canceled the, the training exercises. So this was a time of extremely high tensions and um, there was a mass recognition uh, of of, of a shared interest in avoiding nuclear war. We had in June of 1982, during this, near this period, the largest peace demonstration in US history up to that point um, with a million people in Central Park and supporting the nuclear freeze and calling for uh, preventing nuclear war and, and ending the nuclear threat. The anniversary is this weekend on Sunday. There are all kinds of events you can find online about this about this um, demonstration and the memorializing of it and the current nuclear threat. Um, and at, also at this point in time, and it's, it's really interesting to compare what's going on today, is that a poll at that time said that 76% of Americans thought nuclear war was likely. Um, the American Psychological Association in April took a poll and um, found 70% of Americans are worried that the war in Ukraine is going to lead to nuclear war, and they think that we are at the beginning of World War III. So you can see that there are some resonant parallels. So preventing nuclear war became sort of the guiding principle of the citizen diplomacy movement and what's, what inspired all of us. And people from all ages and all backgrounds came together and just said, enough is enough. We're gonna take matters into our own hands. Our governments can't do it. They're not, they're not, they're doing a terrible job. So we're gonna, we're gonna create something new. And we were motivated by a new story to change, to change, to change the way we dealt with each other. Um, we created new models of leadership and diplomacy. We broke through enemy stereotypes. We catalyzed mass percept, mass changes in our perceptions of one another. We unified into coalitions that truly changed history, um, reduced their nuclear risk, transformed US-Soviet relations and helped bring about an end to the Cold War. I'm just gonna give a few examples, although they're very, very powerful. And there are so many people, when, when we got started as citizen diplomats in the early 80s, there were only a handful of us doing this work. And by a few, maybe five years later, there were thousands and millions of people who had been touched and involved in some way or another. Um, so one of the first and most prominent um, individuals who really captured the idea of one person making a difference was Samantha Smith. And at ten, age 10 years old in spring of 1983, at the height of all those tensions, she wrote to Soviet leader 
Yuri Andropov and expressed her concern and worry about nuclear war and asked him if he was going to start a nuclear war. He wrote her back and invited her to come to the Soviet Union and be a guest. And she accepted. And overnight, she became a worldwide beloved ambassador for peace and media sensation. Um, the media just, um, everybody adored her and, and the media did as well. But we saw this beginning of a partnership between the media and citizen diplomats because we were all worried about nuclear war. She died tragically two years later in a plane, plane crash, but in those two years, she really, really changed the world and inspired so many people who saw this 10 year old girl and in both countries and decided, well, if she can do it, we can do it too. Um, I started the first US USSR youth exchange program it was the first Soviet American youth exchange program at that time. We catalyzed exchanges as demonstrations of cooperation in many areas, including art, theater, education, film, sports, the wilderness, urban leadership and environmental service. So this is one area where I really want you to all consider that question of analogs um, for today. You know, back then there were very limited communications between the two countries. Um, we were told there were three operators in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and you had to book a call a week in advance to call the Soviet Union. And sometimes when your time slot came through, you had to wait literally 12 to 24 hours to get the call. And when it came through, you just jumped on it. It was also somewhat dangerous for ordinary Soviets to be called. So, you know, I didn't really, to protect my friends, I didn't call them once I was out of the country. I had to wait to see them again. So there was this idea, there was, there was a sort of a forbidden nature in communication in many cases, you just had to really be careful. And so this idea was how do we create um, sort of a massive way for Americans and Soviets to come together and a group of visionaries um, uh, who, who had this idea, Joseph Golden, a, so a Soviet uh, visionary at the time, and um, the Esalen program with Jim Hickman, the exchange program, and also um, uh, Internews and, and Kim Spencer and Evelyn Messenger and group who really knew satellite technology. They were TV people. They all kind of came together and came up with this vision and then began the moment of really trying to make it happen. And so many things fell into place and aligned in remarkable ways to make the, the first space bridge possible, which was the first live satellite link between the United States and Soviet Union. And the first one actually was in 1982, but in 1983 was the one that was very big. And it was a, con a link between the US Festival in Southern California with 600,000 people and a studio in Moscow. It was broadcast in the USSR to over 100 million people. And it was the beginning of many space bridges. I actually worked on this space bridge in fall of 1983 connecting to operators in Moscow during a production. And this was the first of many space bridges um, that went on for many years after this, but many of them were focused on common interests. There was one in September of 1983, I keep saying 1983 was a big year, um, on um, having Soviet and American scientists come together and talk about the, the impact of nuclear winter, the, the catastrophic consequences of a nuclear war, humanitarian and otherwise. And Carl Sagan was part of this space bridge. Um, after Chernobyl happened, uh, we had an unprecedented space bridge between, again, um, people operating the Three Mile Island and Chernobyl nuclear power plants, scientists sharing information. Um, and at this point, it was unprecedented in the Soviet Union to share this kind of information on, on the accidents. Um, again, uh, space scientists and astronauts and cosmonauts dreaming and talking about the possibility of going to Mars together. Um, and then later, and then there were many more between people to people with Vladimir Posner, who is a very well-known still today public figure in, um, in television in actually both countries. Um, but we, we, there was at the end of the 1980s, there was, um, near the end, approaching the end, there were a series of capital to capital discussions on ABC broadcast between, um, our, our members, our elected representatives and the Soviet parliament and Supreme Soviet 
and military leaders in both countries, really unbelievable conversations that were very, very honest and critical. Um, self-critical and otherwise. It was really an amazing time. So another analog I'd like to invite you to think about. So um, this, my, my friend, dear friend, Joel Schatz, um, had this idea of trying to link up people through, you know, through email and it, when it had never happened before. And I think he was told by the FBI not to do it, but he actually did it with his laptop in a phone booth in San Francisco. It was the first email communication ever sent between the two countries. And, you know, I just want to say that that we we kept being told that everything we wanted to do from the space bridges to many other projects like this, that they were impossible and not to try. And that was, we just didn't take impossible. That wasn't in our voc vocabulary. We didn't believe it. And we just we just went ahead and tried to do it. And we usually were able to do it. It took sometimes a lot of time, but we did it. So Joel said, I had the idea to link by email two nuclear superpowers, the US and the USSR, which began to promote bilateral dialogue between them. At that time, our countries had about 50,000 nuclear weapons aimed at each other while they were bound by only 33 international telephone channels. The situation was clearly explosive. On the one hand, a destructive potential, on the other, limited communications. So we also had in 1983, um, the movie The Day After. I don't know if any of you know this movie or or saw, have seen this movie, but it really changed history. And it was again, an example of the media coming forward to fill a need um, that was on everyone's mind. And it, it depicted a full-scale nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union um, on a city, a small, small city in Kansas. Um, and it was devastating to watch. It, I think today still remains the largest audience in television history of a TV movie. Um, it was 100 million people. Um, it really galvanized the anti-nuclear movement and the movement to end the threat of nuclear war and to change the relationship with the Soviet Union. It really impacted the citizen diplomacy movement as well. And it was also screened at the White House before the public broadcast, and it changed President Reagan's heart. He said he, after watching this movie, he realized that a nuclear war could not be won. And within two years, he was in Geneva, sitting across from Gorbachev, um, talking about eliminating nuclear weapons altogether and dreaming, to, dreaming, visioning together about disarmament. So this was a really unbelievable, in, unbelievably impactful movie, movie. And back then, the media, very different from today, not commercially driven, not millisecond attention driven, um, really were constantly fulfilling their ethical responsibility to inform us on the clear and present nuclear danger. And they really did partner with us. You know, I, we could call them up and say, hey, we're doing this project at such and such a time and such and such a place. Would you, would you come and cover it or would you do a story about it? And because we all shared, had this larger shared interest in preventing nuclear war, and we all understood the nature of the threat, we were really partners. So it was, it was an amazing time. It was a really blessing to be doing this work at that time. So one of my other most inspiring um, citizen diplomacy efforts uh, that to talk about that really touched so many of us was um, founded by, uh, originally conceived by Apollo astronaut Rusty Schweikart, and founded by a small group of Soviet and American cosmonauts and astronauts. It's, they, they wanted to come together. I'll talk a little more about it in a second, but they founded the Associate, Association of Space Explorers, which today is represented by over 400 space flyers from 38 countries. So the inspiration from this, um, you know, Rusty says that he had this moment when he was in, um, in, on the Apollo 9 mission where he had been doing some repairs outside the space capsule and he was about to come in and he was asked um, to, st he was, they said, we need, we need some more time before you come in. Can you spend five minutes out there? And he thought five minutes with nothing to do out here. Sure. And it became a life-changing experience for him. And he developed for the first time this planetary identity. He saw no borders, no frames, no borders, um, and said it really changed his life. 
he shared this with other American astronauts. Um, they all, a lot of them had these, this kind of transformational understanding of the earth. And they wondered if their Soviet counterparts felt the same way. They could see them at conferences, but they could never talk to them personally. So that was a, a, something that Rusty really wanted to find out. Um, Alexei Leonov and Rusty were both inspired by the Apollo Soyuz mission in 75. Um, uh, Rusty was on an earlier Apollo mission, but Alexei was the commander of the Soyuz um, uh, capsule. And he really was touched by that experience and very open to this idea when it was proposed. And so a series of meetings took place and then they founded the Space Explorers. Rusty says, you go around in an hour and a half and you realize your identity is with that whole thing and that makes a change. And so Soyuz cosmonaut Yuri Archukin said, it isn't important in which sea or lake you observe a slick of pollution or in the forest of which country a fire breaks out or on which continent a hurricane arises, you are standing guard over the whole of our earth. So this touches into all the important work you do at the Arctic Institute. You know, I Pavel wrote to me a, a quote from someone about pollution in one side of the Bering Strait impacting the other and, you know, the oceans connect everything. And so you can dump sewage in one place and it can end up thousands of miles away on a, a pristine coral reef, whatever. So it, it was this kind of consciousness that inspired this effort. So you, we also had um, professionals from all different backgrounds coming together. I mean, architects, um, nurses, uh, people working in therapy with um, alcoholics, and one of the most famous uh, and doctors coming together. And one of the most famous of, of these citizen diplomats was Dr. Bernie Lown, a, a, one of the foremost cardiologists who invented all kinds of things for the defibrillators and um, of, of, of the 20th, 20th century um, at Harvard. He um, couldn't reconcile that he was spending his days saving lives and that there was the threat of nuclear war. And he just felt that nuclear weapons and humanity couldn't coexist. And he had to work on saving um, you know, lives and preventing nuclear war. So he reached out to Dr. Yevgeny Chazov and they founded the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And they won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985, inspiring many people. But really we had so many people going on citizen diplomacy trips. This was a, a trip that I was the guide and interpreter for in 1983, again, September, right after the KAL incident. This, we went anyway, um, and um, this man, Ray Gachalian, was a, among many other things, a firefighter, and he was committed to and, and interested in meeting firefighters there. So he, we got him together with Soviet firefighters and they had a lot to talk about. So, so millions of ordinary people found points of connection. So to come to the project, in the youth exchange program that was the nearest and dearest to my heart that I wanna share with you um, because the inspiration was to really to create a powerful demonstration of our ability to cooperate. Um, and it was inspired, I was teaching in Soviet schools on an exchange in 1980 and my students, I showed them a film about that were bound that I got from the American embassy. And they said, could, would you make it, could, you make, could we ever do this with our American friends? Could you make that possible for us? And I promised them I would try, it took five years from the planting of that seed from them to actually make it happen, building trust, knocking on doors over and over again, being told no over and over and over again. Um, but it finally did take place. And um, it really, it, it became um, sort of a, a catalyst for other wilderness exchanges to follow. We um, inspired um, project rafting exchanges, um, IPP and W did an exchange that we helped them get started also on Mount Albrus the next year. And we made a film about it called The Challenge of the Caucasus to share it with a wider audience. And it was broadcast on the eve of the first Reagan Gorbachev summit um, in November, 1985. And so I'm just gonna share a tiny clip. Uh, I've edited it together different parts of the film for you to get a sense of what it was. Um, so I'm gonna play it, hopefully it will work. Tell me if there's a problem, Pavel, with a lag or anything, but we'll start it. Mount Elbrus, the highest mountain in all of Europe. Summit, 18,841 feet. The pre 
carried on chill of a windy mountain morning, 10 young Americans and 10 young Soviets are about to challenge the most forbidding peak in the remote Caucasus mountains of the Soviet Union. The dream is for as many Americans and as many Soviets as possible to find ways to cooperate and to move forward to better relations between the two countries. Sharing, surviving, living together in the wilderness is a very powerful demonstration of our ability to cooperate. Every time I would try to sit down, he'd tell me to get up. I'd say, Niet. And he'd make me get up and he'd start hiking again. And he'd say, down. I'd say, Niet. And so he'd make me get up and start hiking again. And uh, knowing that uh, the rest of the trekkers are at the top made me keep going. Alexei Kochlov carries a handmade Soviet flag. Troy Schultel brings an American flag that's been passed down from his grandfather. I went up to that summit and I stuck the ice axe in the ground. And I was there with one of the other Soviet kids and he did the same with the Soviet flag. It was the meaning of the trip to me. <laughs> We did it. We are up here. We climbed the highest peak, and, and here we are as a team, together, cooperation, because we all helped each other. Without Chico's smile during the last 100 meters, I would certainly not have made it to the top so quickly. When I reached the top, I had tears in my eyes, because everything is coming to an end. And I also thought, can it be that we will not see each other again? the sharing in the kitchen, and it was wonderful that they taught us their songs. I don't want to see them only once again. Once will not be enough. It's been a great vacation, a great friendship building experience. But let none of us be under the illusion that we've made a giant contribution to world politics. But this is one small step in the right direction. A small step. But it's a step that had to be made, and I'm glad I'm here to help make it with anybody else. Once you've been through something like this, you're bound to be closer, more honest with each other, because you can't lie to each other on the mountain. We must rise to the challenge of better Soviet-American relations, just as we rose to the challenge of the Caucasus. Every step forward is worth it. We don't have anywhere else to go. Mount Elbrus. Let's see. So I, I, I share this with you, one, because um, it, it really was something that took a long time and effort and a lot of patience to make happen, which is what we need a lot of today. But also because um, the image of the two, the Soviet and American with the flags for its time went viral. Um, it um, touched, it really touched people and it went out on the AP Newswire all over the world at the time. And really because the pe people wanted peace, that's why it touched them. And so I ask again for that analog, you know, I'm always asking myself what, what can break through and what can inspire people. So what is that analog for today? We did things in the wilderness with women after this. Basically, we lived to see the world change. We saw our leaders come together and talk about disarmament against all odds. What was impossible, we lived to see become possible with the INF Treaty, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Soviet Union no longer being our enemy, the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union dissolved. So I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I'm mindful of the amount of time that's gone by, but. After the Cold War came to an end, I thought I could stop worrying about nuclear war. And I went to work on my other passion, which I love the sea. And so I worked on coral reefs and climate change um, and worked with the Planetary Coral Reef Foundation and the Biosphere Foundation on biosphere conservation and marine conservation, et cetera. And I thought really I'd be doing that work for the rest of my life. And all that changed for me in 2017 when I was making a film, this film, and I interviewed dozens of the world's top experts on nuclear dangers in the US and Russia. And pretty much everyone awakened me to, this was in 2017, today's staggering nuclear danger, which 
still exists today and is even greater now with, with the war in Ukraine. The two had the greatest impact on me were former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and our US former Secretary of Defense in the United States, William Perry. Secretary Perry said to me that today the danger of some sort of a nuclear catastrophe is greater than it was during the Cold War and most people are blissfully unaware of this danger. That because we don't understand the dangers, we make no serious attempt to repair the hostility between the United States and Russia. And so we're allowing ourselves to sleepwalk into another catastrophe. We must wake up. At that moment, I realized I'd been sleepwalking walking since the end of the Cold War. I came home that, from those interviews to where I live in Hawaii. It was at the height of the fire and fury between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, also when nuclear threats were being traded uh, back and forth between the, uh, the United States and North Korea. Um, nuclear tensions were particularly high in Hawaii because we knew we'd been mapped, map, marked on North, North Korea's map of nuclear death as a target. We were getting instructions from our government. This is December of 2017 on how to prepare for a nuclear attack and how to try to survive a nuclear attack. So all of this was present for me on the morning of January 18th, 20, 20, January 13th, 2018, when I was one of over a million people across the Hawaiian islands who all got this message on our cell phones, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter, this is not a drill. Something is wrong here. Um, so, so, Anyway, I'm going to stop the show for one second here and just um, and just say very quickly that I spent the next 38 minutes trying to prepare my family to survive the possibility of a nuclear attack. And the moment it all became the most real for me was when I called my daughter in Los Angeles to say goodbye. And as I was racing to shelter in a cave, she picked up the phone and she said, and I said, Mackenzie, we've all gotten a message on our cell phones that we're gonna be hit by a nuclear missile. And I just want you to know that I love you. And she said, mom, I love you too. And at that moment, time stopped for me. It was a life-changing moment. Um, I thought, what if this isn't one nuclear missile from North Korea, but many nuclear missiles from Russia coming to us and many from us going back to them? What if this is the beginning of one of those accidental nuclear wars that Secretary Perry and Gorbachev and so many of the experts I interviewed for the film are so worried about? What if this is the beginning of the end of life as we know it, of everything and everyone we know and love on this earth? At that moment, I heard, mom, mom, go, go. So I ran up to the cave. It took 38 minutes for our government to send out a message that it was a false alarm. But even with everything that I knew, or all the time I'd spent, about nuclear war and nuclear weapons. Nuclear war was unimaginable to me until I went through those 38 minutes. And now this experience lives inside of me as a mother and as a human being and is never gonna go away until we eliminate nuclear weapons. So that's how I shifted back to working on the nuclear issue and, and from coral reefs and climate change. And um, it inspired me, I'm gonna go back to sharing screen now. It inspired me to, um, to found nuclearwakeupcall.earth because I, I began asking myself every day after that experience, you know, what could be game changing? What could change our nuclear story? What could transform our nuclear legacy? I'd had this series of wake up calls all in a row. So I found a nuclearwakeupcall.earth and we began to do um, exchanges that were sort of modern day versions of what we did in the 1980s. Um, and because of living in Hawaii, one of the things that, that we did was a concert tour with a Hawaii activist and artist named Makana. Um, and we'll talk more about some of these other ones in a moment. But, you know, Makana basically shares aloha wherever he goes, and he really opened so many people's hearts. And this took, we had, this tour took place in the fall of 2018, which was a high time of tensions as well. Um, it was a time when the United States announced that we were exiting the INF Treaty. So the mood in Moscow was um, very sober and, and depressing. Um, and we actually did something that hadn't been done before. We, we brought Makana and a concert into uh, discussions with experts at the foreign ministry, the diplomatic academy, 
And they said, this is the first time we've ever had a serious dialogue on nuclear security together with music playing in the halls of the Diplomatic Academy of the Foreign Ministry. It really changed the tone. It really um, changed the, the tone of the conversation. It was again at, at this time of the INF Treaty and people were very depressed, but it really, people ended up feeling um, hopeful and inspired by the end of the evening. Similarly, at the same time in fall of 2018, um, I was invited to present at the foreign ministry with the deputy foreign minister present at a gathering um, celebrating 200 years of relations between the island of Kauai, where I live, and Russia. There's a whole history there. And I had a few minutes and I really thought about what to share. And I, again, because the, the feeling was, the mood was so gloomy and dim, I wanted to share something that, that might have the chance to, to change the tone of the conversation. So I shared a gathering that we did with an indigenous elders on Kauai for peace, um, setting the intention for peace with Russia um, that the summer of 2018. And I shared the story of this photograph, which was taken during the ceremony where we were, we were all invited to gather in a circle and open our hearts and send intentions for peace. This is a ceremony led by the elders. And a friend had a drone and was and shot the this moment. And we didn't know that we were in the shape of a heart. We had no idea. This was absolutely completely um, synchronistic. And so the the to share this story at the ministry made a difference. And then I shared a little bit of indigenous wisdom. This is very quick. I'm just going to play it very quickly um, from our indigenous elder on Kauai, Sabra. There's a tremendous need for everyone to be tuned in, to listen to Ho'olohe, to the rhythms of this earth. And most of all, to share aloha, to share love, aloha kikahi, kikahi, love and respect one to another. That's all I ask. There is a tremendous need. So, um, that also had the impact of changing the tone of the conversation because pretty much everyone who stood up on the Russian side to speak talked about how deeply concerned they were, disappointed, um, worried about the future. Uh, but it really, people came together and, and left with a sense of renewed hope and inspiration. And I say that humbly, it's really the indigenous wisdom that did it, but um, it, it was just a way of mixing things up and not playing by the normal rules, if you will. Um, so another area that Pavel mentioned in the introduction that I've really you know, come to is really a, an important thing is to really engage women and girls in the quest to eliminate nuclear weapons um, for many reasons, but just briefly, women have largely been excluded from nuclear policy making and decision, -make, decision making for much of the nuclear age. And I, this has brought us to the brink of possible extinction to state it really simply. Um, the research shows that women are involved in negotiations, um, in, in peace agreements that they become more likely to succeed and they become more enduring once they happen. So um, there are good reasons to involve women as we all know, um, who have been excluded for such a long time, but the research really shows that this is um, an existential imperative at this point in time. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because we're running out of time, but as part of this project, um, we started a year, a little over a year ago, a Russian, an American Russian Women's Dialogue and Peace Building Initiative. Our Russian counterparts um, requested that it be private, uh, the dialogue be private. We made the recordings public but that we start and really focus on building our relationship as a group. At the time, we had absolutely no idea. We could have never imagined that we would be facing a war in Ukraine um, less than a year later. We, um, 
we wrote open letters to our presidents um, that were published widely in both countries, calling for peace, calling for an end to the nuclear threat, calling on our leaders to reaffirm the declaration, which they did not just because of us, but because of many calling for it at the time to reaffirm the declaration, which they did at the summit last year that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought originally by uh, the declaration by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, our last open letter was published on the eve of the Russian invasion. In that letter, we stood with our sisters in Ukraine and called for peace. Since the announcement that um, public opposition to the war in Russia um, can be uh, can result in a huge fine and or imprisonment, we have not been meeting publicly. Um, but the Russian women are every bit as committed, if not more committed, to our work and to continuing when we when the war is over. So this is something that will will is is still alive, although quiet at this time, and um, and we believe more important than than ever, even though it's much harder now than it was. So now to come to Bering Strait for peace. Um, this project was a series of inspirations that happened in sequence in, in my life that um, led to this vision to do this. Um, and I can't go into all of the synchronicities, but we had this happen in the 1980s. I'm sure you all had it too when had it happened too, that when things just line up, even though when they're really, they just suddenly things come together in ways that you could never imagine with people that you've never met before who come out of nowhere seemingly, but who have been sharing this vision all along in this case. So um, it started with an interview I did with Ivan Organt, um, a host of a very popular Russian talk show, late night show. Um, and I asked him, what would, you, what would your message be for Americans at this time? And he said, I would simply like us to know more of one another, see more of one another, respect one another, take an interest in what is happening with one another and help each other so that our countries, which in fact share a border with one another at the Bering Strait and can be good neighbors and good friends. We should not fear one another. We should all fear the same thing together. So that's what planted the seed um, originally for this, this project, for me anyway. And then I came home from those interviews and read a, an op-ed, um, an opinion piece in the, New, in the Washington Post written by Lynn Cox, who during the Cold War, she was a long distance swimmer. Um, she swam, she swam, had this idea that she wanted to swim across the Bering Strait and she just did it without permission. And in 1987, when she came near the border, Soviet planes, um, you know, started coming towards her to try to stop her. And someone called Gorbachev in the Kremlin and he told them to stop and she made it um, to Big Diomede. And it was this moment that was really triumphant and wonderful. She was welcomed, celebrated. And she wrote this op-ed that I read in 2018, just reminiscing about those times. And she, like me and so many of us thought, you know, we should be doing something again like we did back then. And I think she mentioned the indigenous peoples traveling back and forth um, to visit one another who were part of the same tribe. And so that really got me thinking about, you know, again, asking myself, what's the analog for today? And then around the same time, there was um, a, a Russian, um, I mean, excuse me, an Alaskan indigenous elder, Ilarian Rakuliev, there on the left, who had a, um, a calling, a vision to gather indigenous elders from all over the world on Kauai, and they shared prophecy. And I was able to attend a couple of their sessions. And so eventually had this conversation with Alarian about the, this possibility and what did he think about it? And he was very supportive. The elders on Kauai were supportive. And then it was, well, I don't know anybody in who, who works with Russian, I don't know any Russian indigenous elders. And I shared this vision with someone the day before I was like leaving for Moscow on a walk on Kauai, who was a Russian living on Kauai. And as I was landing, as I arrived in Moscow, I had a Facebook message from him. It's kind of a convoluted story, but anyway, um, where he was contacted by someone about this vision for a, a, a tunnel across the Bering Strait, which has been around for a long time, linking the two countries. 
And he was asked whether he knew anything about it. And he said, no, but I think my friend Cynthia Lazaroff would know about it. And then I said, who is this? And then it turned out that two people were, were just arriving in Moscow who hadn't been there for 10 years, a Russian woman, um, Galia um, Morel and Ole Hamakan, and a Greenland elder. And they had been, they, this was suggested that we meet and they actually have been holding this vision for a gathering in the Bering Strait for over a decade. It was also synchron, synchronistic and amazing. So we're partners now and they work with indigenous peoples all over, have been through the Bering State many times, um, work with peoples on both sides. So there are partners for the project. And um, it was originally scheduled for Solstice 2020, but because of, because of COVID, it was rescheduled in 2021. It still wasn't done. It was planned then for this year, but because of the war, it's now planned for next year on Solstice. So um, hopefully it will be happening next year. And, and I want to say one more thing about it, which is Alarian, uh, there's a dream to do something concrete um, as part of this. And Alarian planted this seed when we met with him to do some kind of joint conservation, environmental monitoring for climate change on both sides of the state straight involving indigenous um, indigenous peoples monitoring uh, capabilities and marrying those with science. And so it's something that I would really love, again, synchronistically connected with Pavel. So I would really love to explore with all of you how we might work together on this project and truly show something concrete that can be done. So many of the experts in Russia, particularly, and in the United States too, have said, you know, we need to get beyond in relations, the usual suspects. We need to show that we can do something together and get what you guys are already doing. Um, but to do this in the straight as part of this project would be amazing. So we can talk more about that, I hope. Um, quickly, um, another thing that I think I always have been asking, what could be the day after movie for our time? Um, there's now a virtual reality immersive experience that premiered at Sundance and then also at parts of it at South by Southwest. Um, and it's a, a VR, it's an immersive experience of the Hawaii false alarm. I'm a fellow for this project. I'm in the film. It's extremely powerful. It's actually here in at the Nobel Peace Museum right now, which is the reason that I've been here speaking. And um, I encourage you all to get headsets or if you have you can borrow a headset and see it and I think it may be broadcast as well so but it, it really is um, very very powerful it brings a nuclear threat home so asking ourselves what will it take how do we mobilize today motivated by a new story what is our new story in 2022 what is game changing I mean a couple of ideas to throw out there it wouldn't necessarily have to be this particular initiative but imagining just showing that we can do one thing together to benefit humanity. But the idea boldly of planting a trillion trees together, um, you know, and challenging each other to have an Olympics to do that, and then bringing in all the other countries of the world and showing that in this time, we can actually all come together and do something that climate scientists say could be game changing for the climate and reduce CO2 by 25%. So something like this, I think we need to be as bold as we can be, even though Right now, this seems like probably to many people, I'm talking about this in the middle of this war, but we can't stop the vision. We can't stop trying. We can't stop, we can't stop holding the vision because you know the indigenous elders say that you have to see it even when it seems impossible to make it happen. You have to keep believing in it. You keep, keep having to going, keep having to go for it. Also, just to mention the game-changing treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Um, this is something that, um, again, was it, it was adopted at the UN by 122 countries in the world in 2017. It was ratified, um, it's now been ratified by 61 countries. It entered into force for the countries that have ratified it in January of 2021. There were 50 countries at that time. And the first meeting of the state's parties is going to be in Vienna in about 10 days where I'll be attending. But I think that this treaty, which bans nuclear weapons, um, really needs to be supported. And although none of the nuclear armed states or their allies have signed onto the treaty, um, it's really the call of the rest of the world to make good on the pledge of Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty signed in 1970 and proceed toward disarmament. So it's just a time to remember 
the lessons of the Cold War, when everyone thought it was impossible, that we actually did come together and, and make a difference. And we lived to see the world change. We saw the impossible become possible. And again, if we did it back then, we can do it again today. And it's up to each and every one of us, especially you, the next generation to make this happen. And in ending with inspiring words from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. And one of my favorites of all time, Nelson Mandela, sometimes it falls upon a generation to be great. You can be that great generation. And then finally, it always seems impossible until it's done. So thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for an incredible, inspiring presentation. Um, I want to open the floor up to discussion. Um, so everyone, please feel free to raise your hand to ask questions or to ask questions in the uh, Zoom chat. Um, I want to start with a question of my own, uh, something that you that you mentioned that I had written to you about earlier, about uh, the ongoing need for people to people cooperation at the local level um, at, in the Bering Strait, uh, the issue of marine pollution. Uh, Dan Saris, a waterways manager from the U.S. Coast Guard, said that in the um, in the Coast Guard in Alaska, because we're so close to Russia, because we share the maritime border, we have to have a working relationship in order to handle things. And so this is kind of similar to uh, the question that's already in the chat from Jawahar Bhagwat. Thank you very much for your question, Jawahar, about um, current day cooperation. And so Jawahar writes, unfortunately, today we have a situation where scientists are not cooperating. There is virtually no dialogue. Uh, would you like to comment on this situation? Well, thank you, Pavel, and, and the person, I'm sorry, who put it in the chat. Um, I don't remember your name. But thank you for these questions. These are really the questions of our time, you know, and um, how we navigate this is gonna really determine how we move forward after this conflict ends as well. I think it comes back to some of the things I said in the pre presentation that we don't give up. We try every which way to break through. These, these, this cooperation is more important than ever right now. One, to address the immediate problems that you've raised like pollution, which doesn't stay in one place and travels. Everything's interconnected. Um, but also because if we can show that we can do this, then we can do something else and somebody else can be inspired to do something else. We, this kind of cooperation and dialogue, even though it's ended, we have to find those little, someone used to say the holes in the Swiss cheese, you know, where can you back then, where can you find the point of contact? And even if it isn't what you absolutely want, you know, talking to some of my Russian counterparts on signal and keeping the dream alive on signal, if that's what I can do right now to protect them, that's what I'm going to do. We're keeping it alive. We're holding the vision. So wherever you can do that. And I, I think that I'm inspired by that Coast Guard. I'm sure he's had experiences before, which is what's calling him to this. You know, and I think that you have we have to see where there's a place where the connection can be made. We have to keep trying. And we have to do it in ways where it where it's where it's gonna be safe for everybody doing it. But I can say without going into specifics right now, that um, you know, we can do things maybe invisibly right now together, not publicly quietly, we can plan for everything we're going to do after the war ends. If that's all that certain people in my world can do right now is quietly me, then I'm going to do that as I'm going to, I'm going to jump on that chance. And boy, am I going to do it as much as possible. And there are people on the other side who want to do this. They may not be able to say that, but that doesn't mean they don't want to do it. Just because people aren't visibly protesting the war doesn't mean they're not against it. So we have to look at the conditions of the country, whatever country that we're dealing with and un understand the differences and also realize and keep pushing for our larger shared interests, which are existential, you know, 
And so it's Bering Strait, I didn't touch on the Bering Strait. You know, I think the Bering Strait is very symbolic because the border is less than three. It's where we're neighbors. And all the things I mentioned at the beginning, that it's a place where you see a nexus of climate change, the one extra existential threat with the potential for an escalation to conflict that could become nuclear. Um, you know, maybe it's not likely, but it's possible. And, it, and with relations deteriorating and the war going on, the risk is greater. So it's a place where it all comes together in one spot and it's so apparent all in that place. So I think, and it's also a place where indigenous families are part of the same tribe. You know, they're, they're, they're indigenous peoples on both sides are part, are part of the same tribe. They're separated by this artificial border, which is what Rusty saw from space. There are no borders. It's all, it's all an illusion. You know, it's real in the world that we live in, but when you see the earth from outer space and you experience it, and you understand what that is and you have a planetary identity, you realize that we have to focus on what unites us as Oregon said and not what divides us. Uh, we have some comments in the, in the chat. Uh, Carlos Martinez says, thank you for the great presentation. It feels like we are being held accountable for the actions of our politicians. However, I believe both Russians and Americans mutually want peace instead of war. I hope for peace one step at a time. And Ajit Vartak, uh, thanks you for the amazing presentation. It's not just uh, these two, but the entire world need it. Um, I want to um, hand the floor over to Yekaterina Serova, um, uh, who has a question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate your contribution to uh, this field. And uh, I wonder um, if all the organizations, all the groups that you mean, peaceful organizations where women participate also, um, can they really influence the political decisions? Thank you for that really excellent question, Ekaterina. Um, you know, I think that we have to develop a critical mass of people. So that's why everyone needs to get involved. I mean, it's not, it, it, a handful of people can make a difference. One person can make a difference. But if we can come together in greater and greater numbers, um, and if we can break through to the media, and if we can um, create that kind of viral emotional moment. I think that we can influence our governments. Um, it's, it's again, the work is much harder now, harder for me than it's ever been in the 44 years, honestly, since I started going to the Soviet Union. I, it's really hard, um, but we can do this and we have to. I mean, we don't have a choice in terms of survival. So I think that, um, I, I personally feel with, your, with your respect to women that one of the things that I wanna call for and with Russian and Ukrainian women, um, and it's very hard to do right now is to have women at the peace negotiations. I think they would go a lot differently if there were women from the three countries in the room. Um, so I, especially, I just think even Russian and Ukrainian women, but I think involving American women because we're so involved in this conflict as well in a different way. But I think that we need to have women involved in the peace process because it, ha it has really made a difference in the past. So we have to get to that critical mass. It doesn't have to necessarily be in numbers, but it has to be in consciousness. And so I do think that, that we, we can do it. Again, you look at Nelson Mandela, people said apartheid was never gonna end. That's why he says it always seems impossible until it's done. We have to try. We have to keep trying. Um, Pavel, I wanted to say something that, with respect to what you said, and, and also it relates to what you said, Ekaterina. You know, I know that a lot of these research expeditions have been funded by maybe they're institutional, they're funded by governments, they're official, but what if, you know, someone funded an expedition for Russians and Americans for science, um, for marine conservation, for climate monitoring, something that maybe has been suspended, but it's funded privately. And, and it's done that way. And it's a demonstration like, look, 
we're not going to wait for our governments to come back together. We're going to we're going to get together and do it. Maybe you start, you find one Russian who can who will say yes, and then another and another and another. That's the approach that I would suggest. That's the approach that we'll take for the Bering Strait project for all the people involved there is getting people to to join. If the governments aren't going to do it, if the institutional support isn't going to be there, then we do it. Our, we find a way to do it ourselves. We, we find a creative way to get it funded and, and make it happen. And we show that it can be done. We show a success story. We show that we're doing something concrete and real for the betterment of all of us. That's, and that's where that nexus is right now between your work at the Arctic Institute and the nuclear issue that I'm working on. It's, it's, we have to show that we can work together for all the things that are challenging us. And that can in turn impact our relations and that can in turn reduce the nuclear threat. And that can turn get us back on track to other cooperation and other um, ways of moving forward together. That's, that's, my, that's the vision that I hold. That's my prayer. Again, this is the most challenging time that I've ever encountered in my professional life in, in this field with the former Soviet Union, now Russia. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people agree that it's the most difficult time uh, since at least the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I also want to open the floor to other other comments or questions if anyone has any. Um, okay. so Miranda Olario asks, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. Looking from an overall perspective and on the long term, do you believe the environment could win over business and economic investments through the media and other organizations? I do. I do. Um, I also want to bring up the power of divestment as a way to make a difference and to catalyze change. There's an incredible movement to divest, to take the money away from the banks and the company, the fossil fuel companies. I'm sure you're all aware of that. There's also one to for nuclear weapons. And when you look at the biggest offender banks funding Fossil fuels, they're the same biggest offender banks funding nuclear weapons, many of them. So this is where we can have our power and take our power and have a critical mass and see, it's really hard today to see results. Uh, you know, we could see results back then. We had the partnership of the media, but um, there's a bank in France that has um, subsidiaries all over the world. And um, on the same day, I think it was 40,000 people went into every bank subsidiary of this bank that invested in nuclear weapons in France and divested their money from that bank. Uh, in every, in, and that bank divested from nuclear weapons after this happened. So there's a lot of power in people coming together and using the purse, their power of the purse, and also in bringing the climate justice and the nuclear abolition movements together because we share the same problem with um, a military industrial complex that's controlling um, our policies and a fossil fuel industry that's con controlling our policies. And I'll just say that they're the only two winners in this war. They're making a killing literally right now. And so that's where I think we can win over business and economic investments. We can, when you ban something like nuclear weapons, it becomes um, morally reprehensible. It becomes a moral imperative um, to, to support that ban. It's, we've seen it with apartheid, with cluster munitions, with landmines, and we can see it with nuclear weapons and we can see it with, um, with the climate as well. So I, I feel like that's a place where we can have an impact and, and showing demonstrations of doing something very concrete that's actually impacting human human beings, making it a human story. People respond to human stories. I had to race through the story of the Hawaii false alarm. I don't think I've ever told it that quickly, but you know, people respond to, you know, saying goodbye to your loved one. Everyone can imagine what it's like to say to goodbye to your loved one for the last time. 
find that place in your work. Find the person, who, whatever, if it's marine conservation, if it's climate monitoring, find the people who are impacted and tell their stories. Break through to the media that way, make films. Um, you know, inspire hearts and minds. That's what we have to do. But there are concrete ways through money, taking our money away and exposing the banks. They don't like to have bad PR. That's why the bank in France divested. So, and then invite them to be on the right side of history, you know? They want, a, they want a future for their grandchildren too, so. Um, I wanna offer one last thing, at least if there are any other questions, but I have indigenous, grace with indigenous teachers on Kauai and they say, you know, to keep the vision alive, to go to the place where it's already done, they've said to me, go to the place on the beach, hundreds of years in the future, where your great, 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 great grandchildren are thanking you for the work that you're doing and that they're now living in a world without nuclear weapons. They're now living in a world um, with climate resilience, they're now living in a world with um, clean oceans, clean air. It may seem really, um, idealistic, but if we don't see that vision, they say, we'll never make it happen. If we don't, we have to see it to breathe life into it. So I would just say to all of you, you know, go to that place where your great, great, great grandchildren are thanking you for the work you're doing because you're all doing it. You've already, you're already awake. You're already doing it. You're doing incredible work. So, um, and go to that place in your heart. You know, the, the, the other teaching that Alarian says is that the change, the, the end is very near if we don't change direction quickly, but the change is not going to come from the head. It's going to come from the heart. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to use our heads, but it's got to be the heads working with the heart. It's not just going to come from abstract thinking up here. It's going to come from people being inspired in their hearts to make the difference. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That's such a that's a great note to, to finish on. You've been so generous with your time. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, but you know, um, I'm sure uh, um, let's all stay in touch. And you know, um, anyone here, uh, please reach out to Cynthia if you want to be involved with um, with any of the uh, the mentor programs or the activist projects that she's working on. Um, yeah, and, and we have lots of uh, comments of appreciation for you from oh, uh, you. in our Zoom chat. Thank you, this is so inspiring. I'm just looking at these messages. Um, thank you, thank you, you all are so inspiring. So thanks for giving me this chance to be with you.